Hello, and welcome to Rome 2, Episode 4, The Battle of Aretium. We are on turn 2, and it is spring of 278 BCE. We reviewed some of these city actions last time, so we're going to just jump back into it. We have Lucius Julius Libo of Rome with 1,600 men attacking the city of Aretium, garrisoned with Publius Aurelius Traianus, who will command about 3,000 men once the garrison joins the battle. So, let's get right into it and assault the city. So, the Battle of Aretium, 278 BCE, the enemy sallies out to fight on the field. So, the defender, the computer, could have chosen to either fight in the city or fight on the plains. They're going to fight on the plains, which makes sense because they are numerically superior. They hold a 2 to 1 advantage, so that's kind of a big deal. Alright, so at the beginning of a battle, you get to choose the weather conditions. You can wait for other conditions or deploy. So, as the attacking force, you may choose to wait for more favorable weather conditions before commending, commencing your attack. I like dry weather, so we're just going to start our deployment. And I'm going to go through kind of how I organize my lines here. So, the Principes will make up the center. I'm going to put the Hastati on the right here. Eventually they won't be there anymore. And then I'm going to put the Triarii right next to them. We'll put them all in group one. Then we have the General, and we have a unit of cavalry. We'll take a quick look here at our units. Uh, they're in grass, so you can't see them. We'll march them out of the grass real quick so we can uh, get a look at what they look like. So, our principes, those of you that can see, and look at how beautiful they look. They have large oval shields. They have the spear still, the hosta that it was called. And they're kind of armor. They're still wearing a lot of cloth. You know, maybe some shin guards or greaves if you look at them. And some of them do have a bronze breastplate. So a little bit more heavily armored than the Hastati. We'll take a look at the Hastati over here. You can see almost none of them have a breastplate. Maybe a few of them look like they have a leather pad right in the center of their chest, but they do have the Hasta and the large oval shields still. We go to the Triarii, and pretty much every single one of them is wearing either the Greek style leather doublet or a bronze cuirass of some sort. They also have the either large oval shields or circular poplon type Greek shields because they can enter the phalanx formation. They are still heavily based on the Greek phalanx. We also have our cavalry here, so you have the equites. They are a light cavalry, not really meant for fighting in combat. Some of them have some of that leather armor. Some are just in cloth, but they have a long spear and a round shield. Then you have the general's bodyguard, the corpus uh, legate. They all are wearing a breastplate. They have long flowing capes and large shields accompanied by a long spear. And then you can see there's the general sitting in the middle of the formation right there. It's just hanging out. Let's see how he looks. He looks pretty good. Ready to go. All right. So there you go, there's your visuals, we're going to march these guys up again. I am not going to run them this time. When I move them, they basically automatically run, which tires them out. And uh, I don't want to tire out my units just yet. I want to let them march slowly to get into place. When you look at a unit card, you can see it says Princopes, early, 200 out of 200 men, very heavy spear infantry. You can see they're eager, so their morale is between 85 and 100%. They're fresh, which means they're at 100% strength, and then you see their status. So the way I play pretty much all engagements as Rome is I stretch out my infantry line to meet the enemy infantry line, then I have my infantry engage their infantry, 
And while it's nice if my Prinkapace can cut through the enemy, my ultimate goal is not to do damage, you know, inflict severe casualties with my infantry. It's simply just to hold the line, which is why that extra armor you get from the Prinkapes, right? They have 35 armor, whereas your stat only have 20, comes in handy, because all they need to do is hold the line for as long as possible. What'll happen is I'll have my cavalry circle around the ends, and once I route the enemy cavalry, my cavalry will show up and basically flank and charge the enemy, and as I flank and charge the enemy, they'll slowly lose morale and they'll start to rout and then you can chase them down and get free kills without anyone fighting you back so that's going to be the goal infantry engages holds the line and then cavalry moves around the sides and charges the enemy we are going to actually run into place now because i want to get to where i want to go i don't want the enemy to be there so we're going to run up and then hold we have the general on the left wing, and my equite is on the right. We're going to look to keep the general close for now, just to inspire my units. He has a couple of abilities. So there's the ability inspire. The general begins an inspiring speech that improves melee and range skill of all nearby units for an extended time. Then it also has the ability rally. The general rallies the troops, greatly improving the morale of those within the area of influence. And you can see... Once I click on my general, there's a giant blue circle here. That is the general's area of influence. Principes. Looks like they're going to let me keep marching up, so we're going to actually march even further up here. See, the enemies put some traps out. There's some brimstone pits to the left. They're going to try to catch those on fire. Discovered the enemy's hidden units. I assume there's some traps in the middle here that I'm going to walk over. That's just going to happen. And you have some stones, some stakes, and some walls. The walls you gotta go around, the stones slow your movement, and the stakes will utterly massacre your cavalry if you charge them into it. Yeah, there's the, it looks like pitfalls they had dug, so I had a couple units fall into those pits and Alright, the Prinkapes are in line, and the Hostade, they are throwing their Pelum, or Pila, at the enemy. We are in place. Everyone is in place. I'm just gonna hold for a second here. See what the enemy is doing. The enemy seems to be very cautious. Alright, time to charge in. I still want to keep my line as straight as possible. I don't want any gaps here that the enemy can get through. Alright, so my left wing has engaged the enemy. I'm slowly sweeping my right wing around to engage the rest of the enemy. My equites move to the left flank from the right flank, and they are going to flank this unit of Italian Swingers. Meanwhile, I'm going to maneuver my Triarii to the back of the enemy's line so that hopefully I can catch that general off guard that's back there. So all of my Principes are currently engaged. My Hastate are also engaged. And my Triarii are slowly working their way down the line to engage the enemy general. That unit of Equites charged the Italian Swingers and has already broken them. Broken here means that the flag is basically blinking. It means they can still come back. If the flag is still there, then they can rejoin the battle. The flag has just disappeared, which means these Slingers are shattered. They are no longer able to come back to the battlefield. If you hunt them down, you're purely doing it for kills. But we need to make more people... So we are going to have them break off, reform, and charge another line of slingers in the back here because the enemy does a very poor job of leaving their units open. The enemy general is attempting to run away, so I just slammed that unit of equites into them from the left flank. 
I'm pursuing with my Triari on the right flank, and then my cavalry is coming in from the back here to finish them off, hopefully. Although the unit of Italian Town Guard has just peeled off, so... Nope, they're coming back to me now. So they had peeled off, but now they just returned. The enemy general is trying to flee, albeit very unsuccessfully. We're gonna chase him down. Meanwhile, my Equites and Triari will stay engaged with the enemy slingers. Okay, I'm gonna reform my generals. You know, and he's a little, a little broken up here. So a unit of Italian slingers is broken. They're currently fleeing. So I'm gonna have my Equites chase them down until they go for real. And I'm going to now charge the enemy cavalry, their general with my cavalry, which should inflict some severe damage here, because that cavalry is not paying attention. Alright, another unit of Equites. My Equites have just broken, and then shattered another unit of Slingers, so I'm going to have them go after the last unit of Slingers and pull my tree right away. Their general is now broken, he is fleeing the battlefield, but he will come back, so I'm going to let him run, I'm not going to chase. To see if my general can't do some damage to the enemy infantry. I am heavily outnumbered here. Well, oh, he's already coming back. I to enter the battle, so... He's going to go. Alright, general, let's go. My general's going to charge the enemy general. The enemy general is dead. As you can hear, the enemy general is dead. So that will be a huge morale loss for them. Multiple units are now starting to waver and then break because the enemy general is dead. My unit of principes on the left flank are not holding up well, so I'm going to get my general in there to reinforce them. They've taken almost half their unit in casualties. And I am going to deploy my Equites to chase down shattered units that are fleeing. Because I would like to get some more kills. Now I'll inspire and rally the troops again. And hope that we can break this Samnite infantry. We did good. So the Samnite infantry just broke. That unit of Estate is mostly safe now. We're going to take our Princopes and we are going to flank this Etruscan mercenaries here. These Estate mercenaries. The Estate are still engaged with them, so they're taking a little bit of damage. The Etruscan Estate mercenaries outclass my own Estate. Meanwhile, my General and my Equites are chasing down shattered enemy units for free kills. Although, I guess I should note that if a unit is shattered and you chase them down, you are not actually killing them, you are capturing them so that you can do what you want with them at the end of the battle. Alright, that heavily damaged Princopes is in position, so they're going to engage the Hoplitae Etruscani that are already there. Looks like I have a free group of Princopes here. I'm going to maneuver into position and attack the enemy's middle. It still has three units engaged there with my two. The men are wavering. Uh oh, my men are wavering. Which we thought would happen. It's okay, get in there. So that unit of Princopes is now going to come in and hopefully help that unit of Princopes that's wavering feel a little safer. Yep, they are. So that unit of Princopes is just engaged with two enemy units and they're heavily outnumbered, which is why they were starting to waver. But now that I've reinforced them with another unit, it turns out the enemy is in flight. They were just Italian citizens, so they weren't they weren't worth much. Alright, so we have those Etruscan hoplites surrounded. We are going to force this unit of swordsmen to flee. 
we're going to surround the rest of the Etruscans as well. And the entire Etruscan middle has just broken and is running for their lives. There are now two Etruscan units left. One of them is wavering and it has just shattered and is fleeing. The other is wavering and should shatter and flee at any moment. And that's the battle. Victory is yours. You can choose either to end the battle now or continue playing to run down the routed enemy. We obviously want to run down the routed enemy because that's what we do. You were foolish enough to fight Rome. Now you're foolish enough to pay the consequences. So, I usually don't speed up the battle when it's actively going, but because it's over, we're going to fast forward so we can get through this a little quicker. I got my equites chasing down these units, and my general chasing down some other units. Once we have captured most of them, we'll, uh, we'll end the battle. Right now, there's still 92 Italian citizens out there running around. Oh, they ran into a wall. So not bad. I have two units of Trincapes that lost about half their men. My Triare only lost two men. My General lost about 16 men. And my Equites actually lost no one because they literally just charged enemy Slingers. So they didn't do anything. All right. I think that's about it. We'll go ahead and end the battle now. So once the battle's over and you won, you can hit Quit Battle. And it will show heroic victory. This is victory. Glorious, heroic, magnificent victory. Your foes are utterly crushed. We are going to save the replay because I like to keep track. So this is battle one. We fought the Etruscans. We fought in the city of Aretium. Well, not the city, but the plains. And it was 278 BCE. Alright, looks like that naming format won't work. I'm trying to come up with a good naming format. Alright, that one looks like it works. So, Battle 1, Etruscans, Aretium, then 278 BCE. Save our replay. And we're going to go ahead and end the battle. We'll give you the after action report here in a minute. There's some stats up on the screen that we can show. So 16 for Lucius Julius Libo, 1600 deployed, 356 lost, 2682 killed. Publius Aurelius Trianus, 3025 deployed, 2682 lost, 324 kills. My general racked up 473 kills there. My equites 510 kills. Even the infantry did a good job. Most of the infantry got 150 to 200 kills. So, this is what I call the after actions report. Heroic victory. Rome deployed 1,600 men. We lost 356. We have 1,244 remaining. We killed the 2,125 and we captured 594. The Etruscans deployed 3,025 men. They lost 2,719. They have 306 remaining. And they have 324 kills with zero enemy captured. Because this is their last city, they are going to become extinct, but we have to decide what do we want to do with this city. So, from left to right, we can occupy the city. We'll gain 500 money, but we will have a provincial instability of minus 10 per turn, decaying by one per turn. So turn one will be minus 10, turn two will be minus nine, Turn three will be minus eight. You get the idea. It'll take ten turns or two and a half years until there is no provincial instability from conquering. We will also be hit with a conquest hit, which is minus fifteen on the next turn only. You peacefully occupy the settlement and all captives are released. That is usually what we do. The next option is loot. Money gained is ten thousand and fifty-six. Public order details. So minus twelve provincial instability with minus one per turn. So this means it'll take three years instead of two and a half for that modifier to completely be removed. And then next turn will be a minus 40 hit to public order. 
You gain money from looting, but buildings in the settlement will be damaged. All captives are enslaved. Population and public order are greatly reduced. We can subjugate. We gain 2,000 denarii. There's no provincial instability and no conquest penalty. Depending on your cultural background, the conquered faction will become either a client state or satrapy of yours. All captives are enslaved. This basically lets the AI keep the city, except they become a client state of me. Later on in the game, I assume this will be useful, but for now, I want to occupy the cities. I want them to become Roman. Sack the city. Gain 2,952 money. Public order details, minus 10 per turn. Decaying at 1 per turn. Minus 50 for conquest. You do not capture the settlement, but steal money and damage its buildings. All captives are killed, and the owning faction will like you much less, and public order is reduced. I can't ever see this really being something you want to do. Maybe if you want to venture into enemy territory and just get some money, then leave, but I think you'd always be better off subjugating the enemy. Of course, I guess if the enemy has multiple cities, you can't subjugate them. You'd have to at least sack the city? I'm not sure. Raise the city. Money gained to 200. Provincial instability minus 5 per turn. Conquest 15. Next turn only. All destructible buildings in the settlement are destroyed. All captives are killed and the population is reduced. So whereas sack the city is obviously you take away all the valuables and you gain some money. Raising is you burn it to the ground. The last thing is liberate. You gain no money. There's no provincial instability and a conquest hit of only 5 next turn. You return the original owners of this region to power, thereby resurrecting their faction. All captives are released, and they will be immensely grateful. So this is what I think you would do. So if you... Let's say we're campaigning to the north, and there's a bunch of barbarian cities up there, but they're not easily defensible. Perhaps we liberate cities as we go, and this way they can act as a buffer zone between Rome and other enemies. But I think what I'm going to do is loot the city. It does have a very nasty negative 40 conquest hit, as opposed to only negative 15 if you occupy. It also has minus 12 per turn instead of minus 10, but you get that 10,056 denarii, which I really want. It's going to be rough because next turn will be minus 40 plus minus 12, so you'll have a minus 52 hit, and then after that you'll have minus 11. But I think we can slowly repair Latium's public order. Whereas getting this money here will be a huge boon to our economy. Not to mention all those poor Etruscans we capture, those 594, will be dispersed throughout the cities I have as slaves. And the slaves add huge economic output to your cities. They do have public order issues, but it takes a large slave population for it to really start hurting. So we're going to go ahead and loot the city of Aretium and also capture it. Goodbye, my Etruscan neighbors. Increase in rank. Lucius Julius Libo has moved to rank 2. Faction destroyed. Etruria. Your forces have trampled this faction into the dust. So, as I said, we have destroyed the faction. We have looted Aretium. Settlement looted. Your forces have looted the settlement, gaining much wealth. This savagery, however, has caused damage and outraged the people. So if we scroll over, we can see that the province of Latium is at negative 3, and it's trending at negative 57 next turn. So that's painful. Now, there is a way to remove this, or to lower that a little bit. Whenever armies are in cities, they cause huge public order penalties. But, they replenish quicker. So we'll take the most damaged unit of Princapes we have here. We have a unit that has 107 men left. In the city, they are replenishing 40 men per turn. And it will be fully replenished in 3 turns. There's also negative 57. Well, we can remove them from the city. We'll just put the army just right outside the city. It is now men replenished per turn. 21 and it will take five turns to replenish so the only reason you would keep them in the city is if you wanted to replenish an army quicker now we got lucky because latin is the main culture in aretium so aretium still has basically manpower to draw from but when you capture enemy cities and your whatever your culture is isn't dominant you will not have 
manpower to draw from. You will have to wait for either citizens to immigrate to the area or for you to naturally develop them. Also, Latium has went from negative 57 to negative 52, so we gained five public order by just removing that Ready army from the battle. city. So, some more events to go through. Settlement captured Aretium. You now control the settlement. If your influence in this province is sufficient, you can develop the settlement to suit your needs. Newly captured regional bonuses. Aretium. Your newly acquired region has special attributes that make it different from other regions. These include things like trade, fertility, and public order. So, Aretium. You can see here that it currently has a population of 483 patricii, 1,461 plebs, 7,736 proletarii, and 10,912 peregrini. Like I said, in the event you capture a town that does not have your dominant culture, you will have no patricians and no plebs to draw from, because those are quote-unquote citizens. The entire population will either be proletarii or peregrini. Province under control. You have seized control of the entire province. This will boost its economic and military potential, and you may now issue a local edict. So let's go over... You know what? Let's do increased rank, and then we will do our edict. So, Lucius Julius Libo has leveled up. So as he either sits in settlements, right? I said you can get experience there. Or battles, he levels up. So... Legio 2. We went over all of his traits, right? We went over his skills and whatnot. But now that he's leveled up, he can get new skills. So we're going to go over one branch at a time. So the first branch we're going to go over is the one I go into first. That is called Military Logistician. Every battle can be won before it is even fought. Plus one cunning. Minus 5% upkeep for all land units, and minus 5% upkeep for all ships. The main reason we go into military logis logistician, wow, that word is hard to say, logistician, is for the 5% upkeep on all land units. With a small army like this, it's not going to be huge, but once we get to a 20 stack, that 5% reduced upkeep will be huge. Now, by going into military logistician, we have unlocked four potential pathways here. Master of Scouts, a general skilled in scouting can see victories 100 miles away, plus 5% campaign map movement range, plus 3 line of sight, plus 5% to the chance of discovering hidden agents and armies, plus 5% chance of anticipating an enemy ambush army only. The next one is Military Conscriptor. Even after defeats, armies can be replenished quickly with the right combination of motivation and threats, minus 5% non-mercenary unit recruitment cost, plus 5% replenishment rate for all units, Quartermaster, javelins, arrows, slingstones, I know a guy, plus 10% ammunition for all missile units, and lastly, mercenary connections, minus 5% mercenary unit hiring costs, plus 5% morale for all mercenary units. Now in this tree, I do not use military conscriptor, quartermaster, or mercenary connections. I find them not very conducive to my playstyle, as I don't really use mercenaries or missile units so we go with the master of scouts primarily for the increased map movement range and the line of sight later on basically moving across the map becomes troublesome because the map is huge so the further we can move in a turn the better and then a little bit of extra line of sight never hurt anybody and that's it for every level at least early on we get two skills to choose from Later on as we level, we'll get three, and then I think we might even get four, but I haven't gone far enough. I've only ever got a general to, like, rank five-ish before something's happened. Usually it's old age, because you just run out of time. So, that has pretty much everything to do with Aretium. We did get a bunch of households when we did that. So, households expands are basically either retainers or items or objects that help. So, Lucius Julius Libo got the Corona Ramenea. Well, we were in a really bad spot this one time, and then I dot dot dot. Plus one authority, plus one siege holdout time, double for port cities. I think this is because that Principe unit was in trouble and being overwhelmed, and he charged in, and you got the Corona Ramenea. 
another Corona Gramineo, so he got two of them. We already read what the uh, description is and what it does, but he must have helped out another unit. Lucius Julius Libo got an equestrian turncoat. I'm fairly sure my family will never speak to me again. Plus 8% public order penalties due to local presence of foreign cultures in the local province. Plus 8% melee attacks go for all units during battles against Rome. Okay. Not my favorite, but it's there. Lucius Julius Libo, shield bearer. Stand with me and keep watch. Plus 4% armor for all units. I like that. You know, I like armor. I told you my battle battle plan. Armor is good. Alright, so that's pretty much it. That's all the new event messages. Oh, another household expands. Lucius Julius Libo. Carrier pigeons. Fly, my pretties, fly. Plus four line of sight and plus one authority. Now, I can't Ready equip these battle. this turn because there's a little hourglass icon here, which means they're already in the midst of being equipped. But next turn, I can move them around as I like, which is what we will do. We also have to deal with the money that we have and how we want to spend it. We are now up to 13,940 denarii in the treasury with 2,104 per turn. So we're going to go ahead and repair this Roman hamlet of wine. That'll give us access to wine. Remember, when we looted the city, we damaged all the buildings. And then we are actually going to deconstruct this field of Mars. We do not need a field of Mars or a recruiting station in Latium because Rome has a campus Martius, a.k.a. a barracks. So it's one of the unique buildings that comes with Rome. We'll review Rome later, but that is basically one of the unique buildings you get. We are going to go through our edicts real quick, though. So when... You completely control a province, in this case, Latium, composed of Roma, Ariminum, Esculum, and Aretium. You can basically give a provincial edict. Issues a provincial edict to help control local public order, exploit production, and more. Securing additional lands will increase your faction's imperium, thereby allowing you to issue further edicts across your territory. We're going to go over the edicts real quick. There are eight of them, nine of them, so there's quite a few. Call to arms, minus 15% land unit recruitment cost, minus three public order per turn, plus 8% replenishment rate for all units, all armies and fleets, minus six growth per turn, plus one unit recruitment capacity, minus six food. I don't use this very often, or ever. I suppose if one of my armies got massacred, like the legions in Turtenberg Forest, I would want to use this to more quickly raise a legion, but if that happens, well, that's troublesome. Import food, plus one food, plus two growth, minus 5% local farming and livestock income. As the province of Latium grows, you'll see that it's going to have a huge, huge, huge need for food. It's going to have a huge food deficit because it's going to be a commercial province. It's all about making money. So if I do run low on food, I can always import food here. And as my deficit grows, the amount of food I import will be more substantial. Here you have export food. Minus five food, minus one growth, plus 42% local farming and livestock income. I don't really ever use this because I want to keep my food high. However, if for whatever reason I do have a huge food sur surplus in the future, perhaps in Magna Gratia, which is a farming colony, then I can sell some of the food, but majority of my income is not going to be from farming. It's going to be commerce. Sell slaves, plus 1% empire maintenance, plus 10% piracy penalties in the local sea region, plus 100% wealth generated by slaves, plus 2 public order from luxuries, minus 15% slave population over time, and minus 2 slave unrest. So as you conquer, you can enslave people. As with Aretium, when you loot the city, tying to looting is the enslavement of those you captured. So those slaves that you took were then dispersed throughout the empire, or I guess the republic in this case. If you go to the province details, you can see that the province of Latium has a slave population of 22.1%. That economic effect is plus 20.4% denarii generated per turn, and has a public order effect of minus four public order. When the slave population gets too high, you can then use the Sell Slaves Edict 
to lower the population, thus short-term increasing your wealth, but long-term, you know, making public order more stable and reducing the population to a more manageable amount. I think in the original game I had it, so a couple provinces, the slave population of the entire province was 90% of the total population, which is, well, a recipe for a slave uprising. Romanization, minus one building construction time, minus 25% recruitment costs for all auxiliary or native units, plus four conversion to Latin culture. This is if you want to romanize a process or a province quicker. Sometimes I use this on a periphery province, one that's far away, but in a core province like Latium, it's already, it's already primarily Latin. There's no real reason to use it. This is my bread and butter one, commercial stimulation plus 16% wealth from all commerce buildings, minus two public order from luxuries, plus 20% slave population over time, and plus five slave unrest. As you can see, it has huge slave penalties with the plus five to unrest, but you get the 20% slave population over time. So instead of the slave population slowly decreasing, it actually increases, and you get a huge wealth hit from commerce buildings. And most of the buildings in Latium will be commerce. Bread and games, minus two food, plus four growth per turn, plus six public order per turn. As the name suggests, you give them bread and games, they increase public order and growth per turn. Party loyalty, minus two public order per turn, plus 15 loyalty to the political party ruling this province. This is new to DEI. I don't really know how to use it, so I generally don't. And then tax harvesting, plus 15% tax rate. We are going to go with bread and games for a little while. We don't have a ton of commerce buildings built yet, so the bonus from commercial stimulation won't be huge, but we can use the growth per turn in public order. So that is activated. Now it won't take effect until next turn, so you can see we are still at negative 52 public order. Building wise, not sure what I want to do yet. I actually might not have time to go through the buildings yet, so we're going to hold off on that so we can hit the spotlight real quick. The spotlight for this episode was this city of Aretium. So I figure every time we take a new city, we can review it. So the city of Aretium is modern day Arezzo, located in Italy. It was an Etruscan city located in northeast Etruria. It was founded in the 6th century BCE. That means it's somewhere between 500 and 600 BCE. However, most Etruscan cities were founded in what was known as the Villanovan period of 1100 to 750 BCE. I think we slightly covered that during our Etruscan spotlight, but basically this city was a late founding Etruscan city in the very, very northeast of the Etruscan lands, Etruria. I think the map is a little misleading. It put Etrur or Aretium here, but it was located a little bit more to the northeast. You'll see when we uh, we talk about it. It was built at the junction of the Tibo and Arner rivers. So the Tiber obviously flowed by Rome, which made it incredibly important because the movement of goods. It was also situated in a break in the Apennine Mountains. The Apennine Mountains were the ridge of mountains that ran north-south through the interior of Italy. On the map here, you can see those mountain ranges in the middle. It made traversing Italy from east to west or west to east very difficult. So being situated at the confluence of two rivers, plus where you can safely travel between the two sides of Italy made it very important. So because of that, it had access to both the west and the coastal regions of the Adriatic to the east. So it became a very important hub between where the two rivers came together and connecting the east and west of Italy. It was a prosperous trade hub, and it also had a thriving manufacture center that produced bronze works, pottery, and statues. It was about as far away from Rome as any Etruscan city could get. That's because it was in that far, far, far northeast, on the very, very edge of what would be considered Etruscan territory. During the 6th century, the city of Aretium sided with the Latins in their battles against the Roman king Tarquinius Priscus. It makes sense because, remember, Etruria was a loose confederation of city-states, but they were all still culturally Etruscan. Now, that does make things a little complicated because being so far away from Rome, they might have not wanted to throw in their lot in, made Rome an enemy, but if you don't support your nearby Etruscan cities, then you're making people even closer your enemy, so... 
it was in most of the Etrurian cities or Etruscan cities' best interests to form that loose coalition. In 302 BCE, it is said the Romans helped Aretium, or at least went to help the noble elites who lived there. The lower classes rebelled, and Rome intervened. The force, first force Rome sent was ambushed and destroyed by the Etruscans, but the second, led by Marcus Valerius Maximum, restored order, and the city basically became not Roman, but a supporter of Rome. In 294 BCE, an Etruscan city, Rusella, modern-day Rosalel, was sacked by the Romans. So Aretium, as well as two nearby cities, Volsini and Perugia, negotiated a peace with the Romans. They quickly realized that fighting the Romans was a bad idea, seeing what happened to Rusella getting sacked, they would rather be on good terms, even if it meant giving up some of their freedoms and having to pay a tribute. However, about 10 years later, in 284 BCE, the Volsini broke that peace and joined an invading force of Gauls, those were the Celtics to the north, and attacked Aretium. Aretium, however, still remained firmly loyal to Rome and asked for help. The first force sent by Rome to relieve them was defeated, but the second force, led by Publius Cornelius Dolabella, won a decisive victory at the Battle of Lake Vadimo. That covers the period when Aretium was an Etruscan city. At this point now, Etruria had been subdued enough that I wouldn't even call them Etruscan anymore. They were slowly becoming Roman. However, during the Second Punic War, Aretium was attacked by Carthage, you know, as was most of the Italian peninsula. Despite promising loyalty to Rome, it switched allegiances to Carthage, likely because, you know, if Hannibal's outside your gates with 40,000 men saying, support me or die, you are left with little choice. So, potentially more out of self-preservation than actual loyalty, they switched sides. They did not actively support Hannibal, so they didn't really send troops or money, but they said that they were loyal to Hannibal. However, if Rome was victorious, they would not soon forget this slight. Aretium was a strategically important city because the Romans often used it as a base to launch attacks north into the Po River Valley and beyond. When Rome eventually won against Carthage, Aretium was forced to pay heavy, heavy compensation to Rome because of their betrayal. In the 2nd century BCE, Aretium became the first stopping point on the Via Cassia, a road that stretched from Rome through Aretium over the Apennines into the city of Aquileia. Eventually, it was granted further status and made a municipium. From what I could tell, a municipium basically means it was granted Roman citizenship. So instead of being Etruscan or uh, what was a quote-unquote a Latin ally, those were basically cities on the Italian peninsula that were allies of Rome but not Roman. They were granted Roman citizenship and thus became Rome. Most importantly though, like I said, there was the Via Cassia that went from Rome through Aretium and up to Aquileia, which was even more important. On the map here, I'll just kind of show that to you. You have Rome down here. Aretium would have been located more in this area that I'm indicating in the mountains next to the rivers, and then it would have crossed the Apennines up to Aquileia, which is located right up here past Patavium. Almost done. Unfortunately, Aretium supported Gaius Marius in his civil war against Sulla. After Sulla was victorious, he appropriated land and resettled his veterans at Aretium in 80 BCE. Caesar would do the exact same thing a few decades later. So if you were unfortunate enough to side with the wrong side in a civil war, when you lost, your land wasn't your own anymore. The victors could just come in and appropriate it as needed. In the early imperial period, Aretium was a rel relatively prosperous town. Remember, the Via Cassia was going through it, and it was now firmly loyal to Rome, and it was in good shape. Trade flourished, manufacturing flourished. Even more so, one of Augustus' good friends, Gaius Mecenius, was from Aretium. And so when Augustus went through with his public works projects, he devoted some money to there, and they built an amphitheater, a theater, a forum, and a Roman bathhouse. It also became a major producer of terra siglata pottery, which was known for its distinct coral color that was then exported all across Rome. In the second century CE, Trajan ordered the Via Cassia to be linked directly to Florence. This meant that Aretium was bypassed by the all-important commercial road. 
commerce and trade dried up, and the city fell into obscurity after this point. Other newly formed cities, Florence, what would eventually become Milan, became much more important than Arretium. Remember early on, when Rome was only the Italian peninsula and maybe a few other satellite areas, any city you had was important. But when you became the empire spanning Roman Empire under Trajan, when you went all the way up to Britannia and all the way over to Syria, those little cities on Italy became less important. And thus, our red team fell into obscurity. Over the years, it would kind of gain a little bit back here and there, especially when Rome finally fell apart, and then in the Middle Ages, when it became a city-state again, it had its own kingdom of Aretium, but it was never big enough to really project its influence. It was always either being crowded out by the Papal States, or Milan, or Florence, or Genoa, other bigger cities to the north. Well, that's it. That's all I have to say, really, about Aretium or modern-day Arezzo. I've kind of hit my time limit here, so I'm not going to go over what I want to build yet. I figure with 13,122 denarii now, we can build quite a few things, and sitting on that money for too long is no good. It's unproductive. So next turn, we will build some buildings, and then hopefully end the turn and go from there. Thanks everyone for listening, and uh, have a great day. I'll see you next time.